Item number, SCP-037. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-037 is magnetically contained in a subterranean complex known as Site-22. Object size, spectral signature, and temperature are constantly monitored both on-site and remotely from Site-98. The primary containment chamber is lined with heat-conducting, radiation-resistant, nanopeak GFV polymer tiles and evacuated of any atmosphere. Heat from the object is radiated into the surrounding rock. Should enclosure integrity become compromised, the emergency system will generate a low-power argon plasma shield. This is projected to provide a minimum of four hours for our on-site engineers to effect necessary repairs before the object breaches containment. In the contingency that stellar evolution proceeds ahead of projections and a nova event appears imminent, or if containment failure is otherwise unavoidable, any remaining project staff are authorized to initiate the Pituac Protocol. Description SCP-037 appears to be a star, approximately 5 centimeters or 2 inches in diameter, with a luminosity of about 1 to the power of 10 to 12 times that of our sun and a surface temperature of about 5,000 Kelvin, determined by UBVRI analysis. The origin of SCP-037 is unknown. However, analysis suggests that it shares many properties in common with a typical main sequence star other than its anomalously small size. It is theorized to have entered the Earth's magnetosphere via the North Magnetic Pole. The object was discovered in 19 above the Beaufort Sea at approximately the North Magnetic Pole. Intense electromagnetic interference was reported by Canadian Forces Station CFS Alert followed by an extremely bright object descending towards the ocean from the sky. The SCPS Guardian responded and discovered the object wavering in an erratic trajectory about 200 meters above the surface of the water. Once containment procedures were devised, it was transported to Site-32 for study. Containment and transport of SCP-037 have been achieved by the use of powerful electromagnets to which the artifact aligns itself according to its own magnetic field. The primary challenge to containment thus far has been its powerful electromagnetic emissions, which are intense enough to be easily seen by the naked eye from high Earth orbit. Its current enclosure is located deep underground to prevent detection and to facilitate radiative cooling into the surrounding bedrock. In effect, the entire facility and the surrounding volume of the Earth's crust act as a massive heat sink. Addendum A Over the past years of study, the star has undergone a shift in emitted EM radiation, suggesting that it is undergoing stellar evolution at a vastly accelerated rate. If standard stellar models hold up, this will soon result in an increase in radius by a factor of 100 to 300 times and a concomitant increase in radiated energy. Emergency containment contingencies are being studied for that eventuality. Further progression of the star's life cycle will likely terminate in a stellar nova which is estimated to have a yield of Extrapolations predict this to occur and Research is underway for a method to arrest this development or to transport SCP-037 a safe distance from the planet before it occurs. Item number, SCP-144, Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-144 requires the presence of only one Foundation Observer to monitor and issue updates on the condition of SCP-144. The Tibetan Buddhist monks who maintain the site live in solitude and secrecy. A heavy mist condenses around the small mountain that hosts SCP-144, which itself resides in a small valley between greater mountains. This mist is present most of the year and the thin rope itself is only fairly visible to the human eye within a distance of 3 kilometers. Air travel within a 70 kilometer radius has been restricted with the cooperation of the Chinese government. Description Located in a monastery atop a small Tibetan mountain, SCP-144 is a thin, taut hempen rope, only 1.2 centimeters thick, attached to a ring of jade bound to the floor of an atrium in the temple, known as base camp amongst researchers. The other end of SCP-144 extends straight upward, many kilometers up into the sky, to a yet-to-be-explored satellite in geostationary orbit above the Earth 
at an altitude of about 39 kilometers, over 22 miles away, known as the summit amongst researchers. Several times a year, a monk of the temple ascends up the rope several hundred meters in a ritual of spiritual enlightenment. The monks report that to this day, only one person by the name of R has ever been killed during the ascension. Throughout the centuries, several climbers have disappeared, yet the monks believe that one day they will return, bringing greater understanding and enlightenment with them. Carbon dating of rope fibers put SCP-144 at just over 1400 years old. Foundation anthropologists believe that the rope and the tradition of climbing it began within the rituals of an ancient dead religion, before Emperor Song San Gampo brought Buddhism to Tibet. At that time, it is believed that the rope was several kilometers longer. The attendant monks say that the jade ring was added in the early 9th century by the Ralpakin to keep seasonal winds from picking up the rope and swinging it throughout the countryside. Several times a year, the head monks untie the rope from the loop of jade and reposition the knot. Research has shown that in recent years, the rope has moved skyward at a rate of about 180 centimeters per year and is slightly accelerating at a rate of a hundredth of a centimeter per year squared. With only a few hundred meters of rope left, the monks are unsure of what to do when it reaches the end. Some hope to add length by attaching separate sections of rope to the original, while others believe that new rope won't have the strength of the old. Research has been unable to explain how plant fiber rope has been able to survive 1400 years and maintain such tensile strength at such extreme temperatures and conditions of the upper atmosphere and space that people are able to climb it, let alone support its own enormous weight against itself, all 39 kilometers worth of rope. If the summit is accelerating away from Earth, its pull on SCP-144 is also unexplained. The summit has only been properly imaged by ground-based telescopes which show the rope of SCP-144 going up and over the edge of a large asteroid-like rock, several hundred meters in width. Satellites have been unable to picture the opposite, dark side of the summit. It has been reasoned that orbiting satellites are designed to image ground-based locations, or distant space objects, at much greater distances than other neighboring orbital satellites. Researchers disagree about why images of the dark side of the summit return blurry and unfocused, rendering the dark side unknown. Addendum 144-4 Several Class D personnel were offered immediate release if they were to climb to the summit, if possible, and return. While multiple warnings were issued by the monks attending the rope, no resistance was offered. Of the six personnel who accepted, four returned to base camp complaining of difficulty breathing and lack of air. One slammed into base camp at terminal velocity presumably after losing his grip from fatigue, and the last has not yet returned. Item Number SCP-163 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-163's enclosure consists of four adjoining rooms, three meters from floor to ceiling, with the following attributes. One five meter by five meter receiving room with an airlock, and seating appropriate for both SCP-163's and human morphology. One 5 meter by 3 meter storage room, capable of storing SCP-163's isolation suit, tools, and games. One 20 meter by 15 meter workshop and dining area, which contains all salvaged technology, including SCP-163-1. One 5 meter by 5 meter sleep area and rest facility, furnished with seating and bedding, fitting SCP-163's morphology. Air is filtered into the enclosure and is automatically monitored at all times by computer and once daily by staff to check for impurities. Filters are to be changed weekly or any time impurities are found in the air. Two separate lighting systems are used in the enclosure, one which produces radiation between 400 Newton meters and 700 Newton meters and one that produces radiation between 150 Newton meters and 300 Newton meters. The primary lighting system is to remain active at all times to facilitate observation. The secondary lighting system may be turned on or off at SCP-163's discretion. At no point are forbidden elements and chemicals to be introduced into the enclosure above prescribed proportions, listed in Manual M-163-1. Personnel and any items brought with them 
will be checked for traces of these chemicals prior to being allowed access to the enclosure. Personnel are to wear isolation suits at all times while in the enclosure to protect themselves and SCP-163 from cross-contamination. Before being granted clearance to enter the enclosure, personnel are to study Manual M-163-2 and submit to an interview with Dr. Cleared personnel are permitted to interact with SCP-163 by assisting with repair of equipment and by playing board games with it. SCP-163 may leave its enclosure at any time. It must first announce its intent to leave the enclosure through an agreed-upon gesture and don its isolation suit. The suit contains the same air filters used to cycle the air in the enclosure. In order to facilitate vision, SCP-163 may carry a UV flashlight capable of producing radiation wavelengths of no less than 280 newton meters in order to keep risk of skin cancer among personnel to a minimum. When roaming the facility, SCP-163 is to be accompanied by a junior researcher who is to record all actions, gestures, and expressions with a video camera. The escort is to also bar SCP-163 from any areas deemed dangerous to it. Once every three days, personnel are to deliver to the receiving room a 20-liter container with chemical elements in proportions listed in Manual M-163-1. SCP-163 will take the container and pour its contents into SCP-163-1. The empty container is then placed in the airlock for retrieval. Equipment may be removed from the enclosure only when in the presence of SCP-163. If SCP-163 interferes with the removal of a piece of equipment, the item is to be placed back in the area from which it was taken. At no point is SCP-163-1 to be disassembled, operated, or removed by personnel under any circumstances. Any attempts to do so will result in severe discipline. Description SCP-163 is a sapient organism of extraterrestrial origin. When standing, it is 2 meters tall and 1.5 meters wide, the bulk of the body being suspended 50 centimeters from the ground. The body is roughly cylindrical, with a circular mouth at the bottom, the equivalent of a head at the top, and eight three-jointed legs, arranged radially around the equator. SCP-163 also has a series of specialized limbs listed here. Two prehensile feeding apparatus on either side of the mouth. Two arms near the top of the body, used for delicate manipulation. Two larger arms located closer to the legs used for heavy manipulation and lifting, and capable of producing a steady force of approximately 500 newtons, and a striking force of up to 2,000 newtons. Two appendages of indeterminate function, located between the legs and mouth parts, which had been amputated prior to SCP-163's discovery. 30 centimeters from the top of the body is a single semi-compound eye, which extends in a ring around it allowing a full 360 degrees of vision. There is a blind spot at the back of the head to make way for an organ used for elimination of bodily waste. The compound eye is separated into 88 units. The most likely hypothesis is that each unit receives only vertical information, while the brain intuits horizontal information by comparing input from the different units. The eye is sensitive to light wavelengths between 150 newton meters and 300 newton meters equivalent to UVC, which is harmful to most terrestrial life. SCP-163 contains an endoskeleton, which consists of tissue similar in chemical composition and structure to cellulose. The skeletal structure protrudes from the uppermost joint of each leg, and appears to have been blunted by mechanical means. No pain response is exhibited when samples are taken from these protrusions. The skin is transparent to visible wavelengths of light but opaque to ultraviolet. Blood samples taken have an oxygen and carbon dioxide transport system based on nickel, rather than the iron or copper used by terrestrial organisms, and is green in color. Analysis of blood and tissue shows that SCP-163's cells use DNA for instruction with the standard GCAT bases. However, a different method is used to interpret said instructions. Sets of three bases still code for amino acids, but they are not the same ones that are coded for in terrestrial cells. In addition, 
Some terrestrial amino acids are not present in its biology, while others that it uses are not present in Earth's biosphere, allowing for dramatically different protein arrangements. SCP-163's home environment would have contained different proportions of elements, compared to that of Earth. This is evidenced by its sensitivity to certain common elements, and its resistance to other less common ones. A heavy metal poisonous to terrestrial life is used in SCP-163's metabolism. Iron and calcium, though not used by SCP-163, causes no harmful effects to it. Exposure to in any chemical form causes damage to tissue, and are as harmful to SCP-163 as they are to us. A full table of safe and unsafe chemicals, along with dietary requirements, is contained in Manual M-163-1. Furthermore, the atmosphere would have had different proportions of gases. SCP-163 is able to survive in our atmosphere for some time without mechanical aid, but will begin to show signs of illness after one hour. Air that is filtered to remove certain common terrestrial elements will prevent such an event. Analysis of SCP-163's technology includes searches for hermetically sealed chambers, which may contain evidence of its home atmosphere. It is unknown how SCP-163 communicates complex ideas. The only vocalization produced by it is a steady sinusoidal wave of approximately 15 Hz when in certain emotional states. There is no variation to this vocalization, which can last from 15 seconds to 10 minutes. It is recommended that personnel exposed to this sound remain in well-lit conditions to prevent feelings of paranoia. Emotions are primarily displayed by the dome of tissue above the compound eye. Different states correspond to distortion of furrows in the skin by subdermal muscles. In addition, a negative and affirmative gesture have been noted. An affirmative consists of the rapid beating together of SCP-163's delicate manipulators, while a negative is the same gesture performed by heavy manipulators. Specific information on gestures and emotional states is contained in Manual M-163-2. SCP-163-1 appears to be a universal life support device. It is able to convert basic chemical elements into sustenance for SCP-163, in addition to originally projecting the phenomenon in which SCP-163 was found. To ensure the continued health of SCP-163, study of SCP-163-1 is forbidden until after the death of SCP-163. The function of other equipment is still not fully understood. The technology is limited to crude transistors, assembled into various specialized analog computers. Many physical processes that these computers model do not correspond to anything known to modern science. It is theorized that SCP-163-1 relies on some of these processes in order to function. SCP-163 was first discovered by miners in the Andes Mountains in 2000. The rock strata in which it was found are approximately years old. Shocked minerals in the vicinity indicate that its spacecraft had crash-landed. The miners reported coming across an impenetrable mirrored surface, which abruptly disappeared after enough rock was removed from it. The description suggests that this is a larger version of the phenomenon produced by SCP-163-1, despite being encased in stone for numerous years. The contents of the chamber showed no sign of age or degradation, believed to be an effect of the phenomenon. Approximately 30% of the equipment had been looted before agents could reach the scene. Though some have since been recovered, there are many items still at large. Agents are continuing to scour the black market for any further clues as to the whereabouts of the missing technology. When agents took control of the scene, SCP-163 was still encased in the reflective sphere produced by SCP-163-1. The relative simplicity of SCP-163-1's interface allowed agents to quickly deactivate it. Agents were forced to subdue SCP-163, which was violent at the time. Aside from this initial confrontation, SCP-163 has cooperated with the Foundation to the extent of its ability to understand us. The following are select experiments performed on SCP-163. A full list of experiments and results is contained in Manual M-163-2. 
Experiment Log 163-46 Facial Recognition Date Undisclosed Subject SCP-163 Procedure Dr. entered the enclosure of SCP-163, carrying 30 11 by 17 cards with images printed on them with UV-absorbing inks. Images were representations of human faces of varying complexity. SCP-163 was shown these images from least complex, a smiley face, to most complex, a photograph of Dr. Details SCP-163 was not able to recognize the smiley face, which human infants are able to immediately emulate. It was not until the 18th image that SCP-163 reacted by taking the card and placing it over the front of Dr. Ruffin's faceplate. Image 18 had exaggerated facial features, which included a nose, eyes, ears, and an open mouth showing a row of straight teeth. Image 17 was identical, but with a closed mouth. Experiment Log 163-47 Facial Recognition Date Undisclosed Subject SCP-163 Procedure Dr. entered SCP-163's enclosure, carrying 20 11 by 17 cards, with images printed on them with UV-absorbing inks. Images were representations of the top of SCP-163's body, ranging in complexity from an isosceles triangle to a photograph of SCP-163. Details SCP-163 did not recognize the first card as a member of its species. The second card, depicting an isosceles triangle with a horizontal line going through the middle, elicited a response. SCP-163 took all the cards from Dr. and looked at each in turn. It then sorted the cards into two stacks, one which contained six images, including image one, and one which contained the remainder, including image two. It is hypothesized that the first stack includes images which cannot be recognized as SCP-163 species, while the second stack has images that can. The presence of the photograph in the second stack supports this hypothesis. Experiment Log 163-80 Altruism Test Date Undisclosed Subject SCP-163 Procedure Dr. entered the enclosure carrying two wooden blocks and a box capable of holding both. The doctor opened the box and moved one block into it while feigning great effort. After closing the box, Dr. moved the second block toward it, again feigning effort, and awaited a response from SCP-163. Details SCP-163 opened the box for Dr. after 10 seconds of him attempting to place the block inside while the lid was closed. The result is consistent with the same experiment performed on human children. Experiment Log 163-88 Higher Functions Date Undisclosed Subject SCP-163 Procedure Dr. entered the enclosure with a cart containing an easel, five canvases, assorted brushes, and a selection of pigments, which reflect different ultraviolet frequencies between 150 newton meters and 300 newton meters. The doctor briefly demonstrated the act of painting using three of the pigments before handing the brush to SCP-163. Details SCP-163 immediately began painting with the provided pigments. The image produced was of a landscape containing unrecognizable plants and animals, according to UV imaging. SCP-163 remained still for seven minutes after completing the painting, before knocking it from the easel and retreating to a corner of the receiving room. Cranial ridges indicated distress. All further attempts at interacting with SCP-163 failed, until Dr. attempted to remove the painting supplies from the enclosure. At that point, SCP-163's heavy manipulators were protruded from between its legs and indicated the negative gesture. The following day, SCP-163 was seen painting on a new canvas. Addendum 163-88 As of this date, fresh canvases, paints, and brushes should be provided to SCP-163 whenever its supplies begin to go low. 
This is the first truly meaningful communication we have been able to understand. At the very least, we may be able to learn more about the ecology of its homeworld. Dr. Addendum 163-93 The odds of SCP-163 having been discovered at all are mind-boggling, given the size of the Earth. A number of factors would have had to come into play, including plate tectonics, development of terrain by humans, and just plain old dumb luck. I am filing a recommendation that all excavations be monitored by agents for more members of SCP-163's species. I find it hard to believe that we just happened to come across the one single spacecraft that crash-landed on Earth millions of years ago, at a time when we are just beginning to develop the capacity to recognize the importance of such a find. There must be others, hidden in stasis, somewhere down there. Dr. Item Number SCP-179 Object Class Thaumiel Special Containment Procedures SCP-179 remains beyond the reach of currently known groups of interest, including the Foundation. All containment efforts are to be focused towards a Grade 3 omission cover-up, coupled with the discouragement or sabotage of exploration and research missions that attempt to study cis-Mercurian space and orbits that go through it. Description SCP-179 is a humanoid entity located at a constant distance of approximately 40,000 kilometers from the south polar region of the solar photosphere, locked to the rotation axis of Sol. However, it does not orbit it. The most recent recordings of SCP-179 indicate that it seems to maintain a continuous orbit around the center of the galaxy. Through the combined effort of 43 years of continuous surveying, the external appearance of SCP-179 has been defined as a human female of undetermined ethnic group of between 20 and 40 years of age. Its entire bodily surface is covered in or composed of a matte black material. Its hair appears to be composed of this material, measures over 34 kilometers long, and is constantly pushed away by solar wind. However, this part of SCP-179 seems to reflect variable amounts of sunlight, this reflection being the phenomenon that indicated its existence to Foundation astrophysicists during 1940. Several markings or tattoos are placed throughout its bodily midline. Judging from their brightness, these markings might be of metallic composition and of a golden hue. These tattoos include several symbols that have been identified as those typically representing the sun and the six innermost planets of the solar system, according to medieval alchemy, including in this order. The symbol of gold on the subject's forehead, right underneath the hairline. The symbol of mercury under the nose, circling both lips. The symbol of copper between the medial ends of its clavicles. Data expunged. Autosensor level SC4. Non-trivial cognitohazard detected with the anatomically correct shape of a human heart, placed over the location where a heart would be, in a female human of the same apparent age and bodily proportions. The symbol of iron in the upper abdominal region. The symbol of tin in the lower abdominal region. Part of a final symbol in the pelvic region. While the anatomy of this region makes its clear observation difficult, it has been hypothesized that the symbol of lead is also present and complete in the perineum region. SCP-179 keeps its ventral side oriented towards Earth most of the time, but it has been observed to look towards other areas on occasion. All further data redacted, as per Administrative Warning ES-026. Administrative Warning ES-026 As of SCP-179 has been reclassified Thaumiel. All involved personnel with a clearance level below 4-179 will be either promoted or reassigned to fit this new classification, depending on their relevance for the continued surveillance and cover-up operations as directed by the current head researcher for SCP-179. All reassigned personnel will be subject to Polymath 8 Memory Redaction Therapy, or D-Class Amnestics, in a high dosage grade, with a maximum retrograde effect of 10 years of experience depending on the time spent working in SCP-179 prior to its reclassification. 
SCP-179's existence will be subject to an orbital misinformation standardized intelligence obstruction and neutralization campaign. As per Omission Protocol 4, most documentation related to SCP-179 has been classified Level 4. Top Secret Any further data related to SCP-179 has been classified Level 5. Thaumiel and will be made available only to authorized 5-179 personnel. Be advised that unauthorized access to SCP-179 research materials will be considered a Type 3B offense. Unauthorized data management while lacking appropriate global clearance. Punishable by compulsory memory redaction therapy with immediate reassignment and or demotion. Warning! Unauthorized personnel will be exposed to a memetic defense agent. SCP-179 is sensitive to all radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum, intelligent, and able to communicate through multiple anomalous means, including but not limited to radio and laser communications interference. Only one instance of SCP-179 communication with Foundation personnel has occurred thus far, where SCP-179 proved to be fluent in French. As this contact did not result in a clear statement of SCP-179's intentions towards the Foundation and its mission, all efforts must be made to prevent contact by any known groups of interest with SCP-179. Misinformation operations and other preemptive measures have been deployed. Most recorded movements performed by SCP-179 have been related to extraterrestrial threats, both anomalous or non-anomalous in nature, on a collision or orbital insertion course with the Earth. These threatening items have been identified as capable of causing CK-class reconfiguration events, of diverse impact on human societies and earthly life in general, if allowed to reach Earth. If impact with Earth or orbital insertion occurs without proper response and containment by Foundation operatives, these items of interest may be capable of causing XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios. SCP-179 will usually address an item or items of interest by pointing at them with an arm and, when more than one item of interest is present, will be able to generate additional limbs anatomically identical to its arms, as needed. Survey data indicates that SCP-179 performs other motions specific to each item of interest addressed, such as raising different fingers or moving its arms in an array of as-of-yet undecipherable patterns at fixed intervals. But whether these motions contain any information or not has not been determined to date. The limits of SCP-179's detection capacities have not been clearly ascertained. While SCP-179 has been able to detect potentially harmful objects beyond the trans-Neptunian region, those threats had been detected by other surveillance and exploration systems, usually under Foundation control, or, in at least three separate instances, were visible to the naked eye from Earth. However, they had not been immediately recognized as threats. It has been hypothesized that SCP-179 may only detect and react to active threats that remain detectable to other observing parties, without the cis-Neptunian region, while being able to unerringly determine their harmful nature. All items of interest approaching Earth within cis-Neptunian space that had considerable destructive capacity have been detected by SCP-179 without failure, often when no observers known to the Foundation were aware of them. As such, SCP-179 and all personnel, orbital equipment, and facilities dedicated to its surveillance remain the most reliable early warning system the Foundation possesses to detect and, when possible, prevent potentially dangerous incursions within surveyed space. SCP-179 is able to determine which interplanetary objects pose a threat to Earth, humankind, or the Earthly biosphere which makes it a critical asset for the Composite Orbital Early Warning System COEWS, project of the Foundation, which currently involves several undisclosed SCPs, Experimental Foundation Orbital Assets, Site-34, Site-103, Site-98, Area-8, several other undisclosed sites, and Command Site as well as several personnel embedded within different space agencies and international consortia related to space exploration. All data of interest related to or obtained through SCP-179 will be marked COEWS-179, which will be considered high-priority information to all Foundation departments. Addendum SCP-179-1 
Notable Movements of SCP-179 1312-1940 First recorded movement of SCP-179 The entity, that had remained with both arms crossed, raised an arm towards a previously undetected interplanetary object on a collision course with Earth. After its impact, in an event that damaged the city of Data expunged, extensively with large quantities of an anomalous mucus secretion and left more than 1,300 dead, which, combined with the anomalous phenomena related to, redacted as per previous expungement. Remaining central item reclassified as SCP-179 SCP returned to its original position. 2209-1942 Sixth recorded movement of SCP-179 The entity raises an arm towards on a collision course with Earth. Item of interest crashes nearby Auckland, New Zealand on 04-10-1942. Item separates upon impact into several devices of mechanical nature. Data expunged. Recently formed sub-entities with minimal civilian casualties. Once Foundation operatives contain the item proper, SCP-179 returns to its original position. Mobile task forces all data on involved assets expunged from records. Proceeds to track and destroy all remaining sub-entities. Date undisclosed. 18th recorded movement of SCP-179. The entity raises its right arm towards data expunged. Up to this date, the entity has kept one of its primary arms, shifting from one to the other as necessary, pointing in the same direction. 01-03-1949 23rd Recorded Movement of SCP-179 The entity raises an arm towards an Amor-class asteroid that has adopted a collision course with Earth. The Foundation uses a combination of several SCP objects to launch a remote-controlled interplanetary vehicle that acts as a gravitationary tow line. This mission is announced a success on 0305-1951. At this time, SCP-179 returns to its original position. Note: Surveying elements observed that the entity performed a motion that could have been a nod. Reclassification request to Euclid status filed and denied. 1312, 1998-403rd recorded movement of SCP-179. The entity stops watching the Earth for two days and 13 hours when it looks towards the Jovian system. Once this interval is over, SCP-179 looks at Earth again. 0909-2002 487th Recorded Movement of SCP-179 SCP-179 points at an armed Type 11 dimensional weapon launched from Area 8 to test SCP-179's detection capacities. Item remains in a primed configuration for several minutes, ready to be launched at a test location on Earth. It is not identified by SCP-179 until it is 3,670 kilometers above the Earth's surface, when SCP-179 reacts to it as a threat and points at it. Device subsequently reconfigured to a standby configuration and redirected towards its primary target. Data expunged, still in transit from the Kuiper belt. SCP-179 returns to its previous position. 1610-2003 Contact with SCP-179 is achieved via the 2 probe. Subsequent movements registered in Addendum SCP-179-2. SCP-179 reclassified Thaumiel. Addendum SCP-179-2. Events of 1610-2003. SCP-179 was first approached by the 2 probe, a microsatellite equipped with multiple recording, analysis, and communication devices, incorporated into a second probe in a clandestine operation. The probe acted as a relay for the 2 probe and Foundation mission control. Contact and communication with the entity were not foreseen nor programmed. When visual contact with SCP-179 was established, obtaining an unprecedentedly clear, very high-resolution image of its surface, the entity begins to move its lips forming the phonemes of a greeting in spoken French. What follows is a complete translation of the exchange. SCP-179 Hello. I'm the Lookout. My name is Sal Susor. Do you like my brother? I like him too. 
He is big, so big, and so very warm. If you want to talk to me, please use your satellite to weave talk to me. It'll be easier than coming here. Probably. Entity remains immobile for approximately 10 minutes. Researchers assigned to SCP-179 detect this movement. Level 3 researcher Thomas Graham, who is fluent in French, is selected by head researcher to conduct a possible exchange with SCP-179. The R2 probe is used as a radio relay from this point onward. SCP-179 is able to receive, understand, and transmit radio communications. SCP-179's transmissions read as a monotone, featureless human voice that speaks in French. The subsequent exchange occurs with a 16 minutes and 39.6 seconds delay between each message, corresponding to the distance between SCP-179 and Earth and return that will be omitted in the rest of this document. Researcher Graham, who are you? SCP-179, my name is Saul Susor. I am the lookout. I behold, I often see, I often warn, almost always when I have to. That way, there is further life. Researcher Graham, what do you mean, the lookout? SCP-179, it's me, smiles. Researcher Graham, we have noticed the significance of your movements. Who do you report to? SCP-179, to those who know where to look, to you, to those who want to look, not just you, but you too. Researcher Graham, when you say brother, are you referring to the sun? SCP-179, he is my brother, Sawel. He warms me up. He is carrying fire and loving light. He caresses me with his arcs and his voice and renews me. He is the source of all true light. He is your source. Researcher Graham, where do you come from? SCP-179, I was born a child. The entity nods towards Earth. Researcher Graham, for how long have you been in your current location? SCP-179, I do not want to tell you. Smiles. SCP-179 adopts a fetal position, remains looking towards the Earth, and pointing at face of the entity remains visible from the two probe. Researcher Graham, how did you reach your current position? How did you acquire the properties you currently possess? SCP-179, I was grown into a woman. This is how I live now. Researcher Graham, could you give us further details, please? SCP-179, no. Researcher Graham, we would like to know more about you. Why not tell us? SCP-179, I am sorry. I won't be yours. I can't belong to any one person. Researcher Graham, the Foundation's work protects all of humanity, all life on Earth. Don't you find this work of the greatest importance? SCP-179, yes, I am doing it. Look upon me and know. Researcher Graham, if we have understood your capacities correctly, we believe you could do far more than that. Sharing all the information you have, not just about the dangerous threats against humankind and Earth, could be of great benefit to all parts involved. SCP-179 I am too big, and you are too small. There is a sea of nothing, and islands of light. I am their shore. To you come the monsters. The pounding fists of void. The longing gods beyond our knowledge. I am the lookout. I see the ripples in their wake. You want me to pledge my sight no to you, only to you, so you, only you, can be greater. Even if you find, restrain, defend, you want me to be yours. That is not why I am here. There are others. Others I assist. Others I warn. Others beyond your thin walls of gray, dry paste rock. Others beyond the reach of your weary satellites. Others beyond the home, our home. Others I know. Others I love. Others you won't care for. Others that came before. And, overall, 
Others beyond the little walls of rules and bone and laws and flesh and memories and oaths you built around yourselves, until you don't even remember them. Others I love, dearly, and yet only my brother is an equal to me. Researcher Graham, excuse me, I don't understand what you mean by others. Could you please explain yourself with other words? SCP-179 smiles, but I have no words left. Closing. Despite several communication attempts, SCP-179 did not perform any other movements, nor transmit other messages. Up to this date, SCP-179 has not responded to any message coming from any Foundation contact team, or any other efforts from known groups of interest. Item Number SCP-206 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures As SCP-206 is currently unable to be secured, an information suppression plan has been put into effect to conceal its existence. Frequencies known to be used by SCP-206 are to be monitored, and all images relayed to Earth via other probes or satellites deleted from non-Foundation assets after they have been retrieved. Technology and astronomy websites, journals, and periodicals are to be monitored for discussion of the rover or the receipt of unusual photographs. Persons who become aware of the existence of SCP-206 are to be administered amnestics. Update. As orbital observation of SCP-206 has proven possible, agents within satellite and aerial imaging organizations are directed to keep watch for instances of SCP-206 and remove the images concerned. Deployment of Image Corruption Cover Story Suggested Description SCP-206 is a Martian exploratory rover, designation Invictus, launched on 12-08-2000 as part of a joint Russian Space Research Institute slash European Space Agency effort. Despite a successful launch aboard a Soyuz FG rocket, telemetry data was lost on 16-01-2000 roughly halfway to Mars. Attempts to re-establish communication failed, and the craft was declared lost. On 08 06 2000, a day after Invictus was planned to arrive on the Martian surface, a connection was established with ESA flight control on the rover's assigned frequency. Before terminating at the source, 38 photographs were transmitted, appearing to show views of the expected landing zone in the Victoria Crater. Three days later, a further batch of 11 images was received, showing a drastically different location, later determined to be in the Cydonia Mense, roughly 2,500 kilometers due south. The Foundation was informed of the incidents by operatives at the ESA shortly thereafter, and moved to investigate. Containment procedures were instituted when ESA Control received a batch of five images, showing panoramic views of the Martian surface, apparently taken from its satellite Deimos. How the rover, which, as designed, is rated at maximum speed of 90 miles per hour on flat ground, traveled between these locations is currently unknown. SCP-206 contacts Earth sporadically, utilizing its original channel. Once a connection is established, it uploads a number of images in varying formats. Pictures received do not always correspond to the hardware originally installed on Invictus, though the signature and session initiation packets match those programmed. Tracking stations have received a total of images. A large number of these images, roughly 38%, appear to have been taken on Earth, or worlds similar to it, differing in some detail. The remaining photographs seem to have been taken on, or in the region of, various celestial bodies, only a small percentage of which are currently identified. Periods between transmission vary considerably. The shortest registered to date is 26 hours, the longest, 511 hours. Despite visual confirmation of the existence of something resembling the rover, no trace of it has been found in the received images, even when the scene includes a reflective surface. Further, a number of photographs show locations exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, for a rover the size and shape of Invictus to access. Addendum 206-01 At the time containment procedures were instituted, it was unknown whether the transmissions originated from the probe itself, or 
if an unknown entity had simply co-opted the frequency and was impersonating the rover. However, on 13-08-2000, SCP-206 transmitted a photograph of what was identified as a portion of a lunar ranging retro reflector. Nearby orbital assets were retasked to survey the relevant regions, revealing tracks closely resembling those a rover the size and shape of Invictus could be expected to leave. On 30-11-2000, Japanese lunar orbiter Selene captured the vehicle itself during a camera calibration session over the Copernicus crater. Four hours later, SCP-206 uploaded a new image, showing a view of the same region. Since then, SCP-206 has been captured by several satellites in various locales. Addendum 206-02 Though SCP-206 generally uses data expunged, on at least five occasions images have been transmitted to, or via, civilian or military space assets. No connection between the image sets in question has been found. Archive of images sent by SCP-206 Date 07 06 2000 Number of images 38 Description The image sent appears to document SCP-206's landing on Mars. Image 1 shows a view of the Victoria Crater, looking to the northeast, from approximately 3 kilometers above the surface. Images 2 through 37 show the same region at continually decreasing altitudes. Image 38 seems to have been taken at ground level, roughly 500 meters southwest of the mission's intended landing point. Date 10 06 2000 Number of images 11 Description Mars, Cydonia Mense Date 17 06 2000 Number of images 5 Description Exoatmospheric view of Mars Based on the alignment of celestial bodies in the local cluster, the image was taken from Deimos. Date 2106 2000 Number of images 1. Description The first single image set, showing the rear of the Spirit Rover, which was, at the time, traversing the Gusev Crater. No anomalous readings or images were reported from Spirit. Date 0707 2000 Number of images 1. Description Ruins of the Temple of Mars Ultor, Rome, Italy. This is the first image sent by SCP-206 that shows a place on Earth. Date 1308 2000 Number of images 1. Description Single image showing the top left portion of a lunar ranging retro reflector, later identified as belonging to Apollo 15. Image displays qualities consistent with being taken by a Hasselblad 500-EL data camera, a device not fitted to Invictus. Date 2908 2000 Number of images 7 Description Various views of Mount Rushmore, South Dakota, USA Date 0110 2000 Number of images 1 Description Stern portion of a sunken ship. Letters L, S, T, and N are readable. Date 1412 2000 Number of images 1. Racetrack Playa, Death Valley, USA Image shows the trace of one of the sailing stones. Description Judging by the lower part of the image, as well as the stone's trajectory, the image seems to have been taken from one of the sailing stones. Date 0702 2000 Number of images 1. Description 29 boxes with light bulbs. The place was not actually determined. Judging by the doors, it's a subway entrance in one of the Northern Hemisphere cities. Date 1102 2000 Number of images 1. Description A metal construction of a humanoid figure on a horse-like four-legged creature. Both the rider and the horse seem to be composed of multiple small details. Date 
2104 2000 number of images one description tractor later identified as a universal model on the porch of the Belgorod Regional Study Museum in Russia date 1109 2000 number of images 41 description 13 images show a funeral mass in a church later determined to be St. Jerome, Nordwick, Netherlands. The rest depict a burial of a man in the aforementioned church graveyard. The man was later determined to be D.I., Chief Structural Engineer of the Invictus Mars Rover Project. Date 1209-2000 Number of Images 1. Description Gravestone of D.I. The image is smudged. Some dark liquid stains were present on the camera lens at the moment of filming. Later investigation found SCP-206 tracks near the grave and two of unknown breed. Date 2402-2000 Number of images 1. Description Mount Rushmore with the face of Jefferson Davis instead of Abraham Lincoln one of the first photographs to depict an Earth different from the original. Date 0307 2000 Number of images 1. Description Moscow Kremlin The image appears to be taken from the Greater Stone Bridge. The walls and the towers are white, although judging by the vegetation and people caught on film, the time the image was taken is consistent with the time it was received. Date 0108 2000 Number of images 1. Description A small football field. Exact location unknown. It should be noted that all people and some objects depicted are lacking shadows. Date 1509 2000 Number of images 1. Description Taj Mahal, Agra India. Judging by the perspective, the image was taken from the main spire. The structure doesn't look any different from the one we know, but the domes are adorned with gilded symbols that don't belong to any known alphabet. Date 30 11 2000 Number of images 8 Description The Moon, Copernicus Crater Japanese space probe Kaguya has caught SCP-206 on camera here approximately at the same time. Date 1101 2000 Number of images 1. Description Primary coolant circuit of a nuclear reactor from the inside. Date 1303 2000 Number of images 1. Description Temple of Khafre, Giza, Egypt Judging by the perspective the image was taken from the Great Sphinx's nasal bridge. Date 0706 2000 Number of images 1. Description Two broken TV sets with a house cat, Felis Sylvestris Catus, sitting on one of them, looking sideways. Date 2407 2000 Number of images 1. Description a deceased man, lying in what looks like a coffin. The man was presumed to be P.F., a known actor, but at the moment the image was taken, he was alive. Date 2907-2000 Number of images 1. Description A scattering flock of doves. The place was later recognized to be the Cathedral Square, Belgorod, Russia. Date 1608 2000 Number of images 1. Description A lot of dead fish in an unknown place. Date 3110 2000 Number of images 1. Description A view of a tank driver's seat. The interior looks like a Mao's super heavy tank, but a lot more modern. Date 2603-2000 Number of images 9 Description 
an architectural ensemble that looks like Forum of Augustus, Rome, Italy, but in pristine condition. One of the photographs depicts an electronic display installed next to the building, presumed to be the Mars Altor Temple. The image shows some text on an unknown dialect of Chinese scrolling on the display. Partial translation reads, Hail, Mars the Savior, great helmsman who led unknown and raised the celestial empire, unknown, unknown, a hundred flowers, unknown. May your spear strike unknown, shields to cover us. Date, 0204, 2000. Number of images, three. Description, interior of the Kosnitsi Church, Kutna Hora, Czech Republic. The interior looks like the actual church, but some of the skulls can be seen having three eye sockets. Date, 0404. 2000 Number of images 1. Description A view of Lopan River from the window of Harkov National University building. Judging by the perspective, the building is at least 10 stories taller than the actual one, although the background corresponds to the date the picture was taken. Item number SCP-287 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-287 is stored in a climate-controlled secure locker in Site-22 in order to prevent additional deterioration. At this time, no additional testing is required, but may be approved by Dr. Sigurd Olafsson. Sources of electricity are to be kept away from SCP-287's locker at all times. If testing with SCP-287 is required, Insulated gloves are to be worn to prevent accidental discharge into the hilt. SCP-2871's remains are to be kept in storage until further notice. Research requests for SCP-2871 can be routed to Dr. Zarshan and are restricted to Level 4 personnel or Level 2 personnel from the Exobiology Department. Description SCP-287 is a Viking arming sword measuring 78 centimeters from pommel to tip and weighing 1,077 grams. SCP-287 is in a state of significant decay due to exposure to outside elements for anywhere from 900 to 1,100 years. SCP-287 was found in Iceland, alongside several written records. SCP-287 is comprised primarily of iron, with several potentially anomalous components incorporated into its structure. Several of these materials have been detected by Foundation probes traveling within extrasolar regions of our galaxy, as well as probes which Carbon dating has placed SCP-287's creation to around the early 10th century CE. Samples of exoplanetary metals and materials have proven to be more difficult to date, and analysis is ongoing. SCP-287's anomalous effect can be observed when an electrical current is applied through the metallic portions of the hilt, exposed just below the guard. These exposed elements are in a noticeably better state than the iron portions of SCP-287. SCP-287's internal components will begin to emit several frequencies of EM radiation and varying sounds, invariably described as distressing by research staff and test subjects. Radiation produced by SCP-287 causes all humans who are exposed to it to experience acute audiovisual hallucinations and severe headaches. SCP-287's specific hallucination takes the form of translucent human-like figures in the immediate vicinity, invariably outfitted as members of an armed force. The armament and armor worn by SCP-287's hallucinations varies by subject but with a general trend towards the individual's perception of what they consider to be modern armament. Testing with animals as well as non-anomalous EM fields and sounds of the exact same frequencies do not produce the same effect in any combination of cases. Higher amperage currents have increased this effect to a maximum of 437 individual hallucinations. Further testing was deemed unnecessary. SCP-2871 is believed to be an extraterrestrial organism found in the same location as SCP-287. The exact origin of SCP-2871 is unknown at this time, 
A full report on SCP-2871 can be found in document R27-287-1. SCP-2871 is potential spacecraft, designated SCP-2872, appears to be completely destroyed. The current working hypothesis for SCP-2872 is that it was intended as some form of escape pod from a larger vessel. Discovery SCP-287 was recovered from a burial mound outside of Iceland on January 2000. The remains found within the tomb proved to be non-human, and the Foundation took custody of SCP-287, and the remains were designated SCP-2871. SCP-2871's remains are skeletal and are humanoid, though significantly different from human skeletal structure. Additionally, several written sources were found within the tomb and acquired by the Foundation. Dr. Sigurd Olafsson was consulted to help translate the writing enclosed in Addendum A. Addendum A Prepared by the Department of Terra Linguistics the discovery of SCP-287 was predicated upon reports of ghost soldiers in an area outside of Iceland. A recent storm had struck the burial mound containing SCP-287, conducting current into SCP-287 through a crude lightning rod made of iron. The hallucinations created by SCP-287 affected an amateur film crew. The crew informed local authorities and Foundation information gathering subroutines flagged these reports as potentially anomalous. Keywords Ghost Spectre Crazy Kids Hallucination with a double correlation factor of Gamma 6. Class A amnestics were administered to all witnessing parties, and the burial site was declared a heritage dig site through a Foundation Shell Corporation. Within the burial mound, Foundation agents discovered SCP-287, SCP-2871, and additional written materials dating back to the early 10th century CE. A transcription was created by Dr. Sigurd Olafsson. Unintelligible sections are most likely proper nouns, with no direct translation. I am Halvor Scottison, Scald of Unintelligible, and I have been trusted with the tale of Thor's champion, the Meteor Lord. In the depths of winter, the year after the Great Raid, we saw a fiery meteor in the sky. It landed deep in the heart of the northern wastes, and we followed it. A wondrous thing it was, gleaming and covered in ghost lights. We approached and found a man standing in a heavy cloak, examining the meteor. The ghost lights went dark, and the figure pressed his hand to the outside of the star. A wondrous light filled our eyes as the star opened. He disappeared into the meteor and emerged to look at us with such fiery determination in his eyes. We knew he could only be a king, sent to us from Odin himself. He would protect us from the raids, and we would know prosperity again. Our prayers had been answered. Daily did the elders of our village come to his resting site, but his tongue was blessed only to speak the language of the Aesir. Weeks passed as he learned our language. When he learned of our plight, he appeared to grow angry and charged back to the meteor to fashion himself a mighty weapon with which to defend the village. Weeks later, he emerged with a sword in his hand, gleaming and mighty. He held it aloft and his power was made manifest. Ghostly warriors, heroes from Valhalla stood around him, brandishing weapons we threw ourselves to the ground, our heads aching with the glory of these Valhalla warriors, and this pleased the Meteor Lord. For years, when the raids came, we ran in supplication to the Meteor Lord. He emerged, and all fled from his flashing blade and burning eyes. We marked the way to the Meteor Lord's home with the Cairn Stones. During the Battle of Unintelligible, the Meteor Lord's fall came. His powers failed him, and Odin recalled him to Valhalla. We buried him with all the honor we could muster, and fashioned a conduit for the great storms from Thor. On stormy nights, the heroes still come and watch over our village, their glory splitting the head of any man who dare look upon them. Addendum B Prepared by the Department of Exolinguistics Tracing back from the story presented in the included writings, 
Foundation agents tracked down the meteor mentioned in the epic translated by Dr. Olafsson. Excavating the object in question led to an almond-shaped craft made of an unknown material. Research regarding this craft can be found in document R27-287. Within the craft, several records were found, written in an unknown language upon crude paper. It is hypothesized that this is some kind of journal of SCP-2871. An exact translation is nearly impossible. However, using a partial translation has been attempted. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown place. Unknown people. Primitive. Violent. Untranslated didn't survive. Everything is lost. Must find a way back. Too many counting on me. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several days later. They found me. Managed to put together untranslated. Hood. They won't see me. Must learn their language. Must keep them away from me. Unknown biology. May infect. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several weeks later. I see their weapons. Mine non-functional. Made one like theirs. Used last of the untranslated. Tuned to alien brain chemistry. Hope it scares them off. Not sure how much longer I can work on untranslated. Not having most likely a proper noun. Nearby is unbearable. Dying. Breaking. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown time. They came back. I use the weapon. Scares them. Untranslated. Almost done. May be able to leave. Down to 16 cells? Items? Spheres? Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown time. They brought others. I scared them again. Not sure if I can repair the untranslated. Thought I had enough. Closest match was a chemical formula matching SCP-148. Used most likely a proper nouns. Necklace. Still not enough. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several years later. Won't stop coming. Only one cells. Items. Spheres. Left. Time running out. Power nearly gone. I can't repair. Untranslated. Too many. Unit of time. It is hypothesized that at this point, whatever power source SCP-2871 was using to activate SCP-287 ran out. SCP-2871 was most likely killed during the next raid, without SCP-287 to protect them. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.